We take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be in verses 7 through 11 this morning. You know, one of the most pernicious and dangerous threats and teachings that face the church today is what has come to be called the prosperity gospel. And for those of you who don't know what that is, let me boil it down for you. It's the belief that God wants every believer to possess great material wealth, perfect physical health, and a prosperity in everything that he or she touches. And it's all directly correlated to how much faith you exhibit. Now, our text this morning has been used by many of the prosperity gospel proponents to say, see, God wants you to have everything that you want. But, but the problem is that, that that's adding to the text of the gospel. And any time that you add to the text of the gospel, you end up with less than the gospel. You would think that if you add to it, you'd get more. But that's not the case with the gospel. When you add to the gospel, you have no gospel at all. And that's the case here. You see, in the case of the prosperity gospel, it is a legalistic addition to the gospel. Because what has happened is they say your blessing is contingent upon what you do, not what Christ has done for you. And it's, it's, we might think that how could anybody come to that conclusion? But I have to tell you as the picture of uh, the attendance at one of the most uh, uh, well-known purveyors of this false teaching, it's incredibly popular in our society today. For those of you who may not know, this is Joel Osteen's church. I use that last word rather loosely. Uh, this is in an old arena. Listen, the prosperity gospel has an incredible draw. And it's not only in our culture, even though our culture is the one that has created it, it has an incredible draw all over the world. Talk to missionaries in Africa. Talk to missionaries in, in India, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America especially. The prosperity gospel is the largest growing church there is. In fact, in I was just reading in Africa, they expect that by 2030... There will be about 1.1 billion Christians in sub-Saharan Africa. And of those, and, and Pew, when they did that research, they took anybody who identified as a Christian. So that's a broad swath. But of that number, about 37% identified as Protestant Christians. That number comes out to be uh, about 400 million Christians in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030, that's 86 million more than what we have in the United States as a total population today. And among that number, the fastest growing group are those who hold to the prosperity gospel. Why would this not be enticing? I mean, those who say that God wants every believer to be healthy, wealthy, and, and prosperous with everything that they touch, why wouldn't that be attractive? It would be, wouldn't it? And when you talk to people who are poor, who are sick, who are facing cancer, who are facing terminal illness, it is very tempting. They promise you everything. But they never bring up those pesky words of Jesus. The ones like he said to the rich young ruler, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Or what he said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You see, there's a dark, crushing, and I'll be blunt, demonic corollary that goes with the prosperity gospel, and that is this. If you are poor, if you are sick, it is your fault because you didn't have enough faith. Brothers and sisters, I have seen the devastation that this theology causes in people's lives. I've seen it all my life because I grew up in an area where this nonsense is very prevalent. So the prosperity gospel says, if you'll just give more of your money, it's seed faith after all. Just give more of your money to that slick guy on TV who's a huckster. Get your magical prayer hanky or your healing snake oil and just try harder. That is the anti-gospel. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why it's all the more important than when we approach texts like the one that we are studying this morning, that we do so with great care, that we take it in the context in which it is written, and we rightly divide the word of truth. You see, God is a generous God. God gives more than we could ever imagine. He fills our cup to overflowing, but he is by no means a personal genie that when you rub the lamp, he's got to grant whatever it is you ask for. No, the truth is so much greater than that. So will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? The Apostle Matthew writes, beginning in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Father, you are awesome. More than words can describe, more than our hearts can even comprehend, Father, you are awesome. You are majestic, you are gracious and loving and kind. And Father, you are generous. But we know that some have taken this truth and twisted it and taken error and mixed it in to make it palatable and tempting to others. So Father, we ask you this morning as we study this text that we might come to a better understanding of what it means to ask and to receive. Father, that we might know what things we should ask for and trust in you to provide them. Father, I pray that we take your word, we apply it to our hearts, and that we go out from here better stewards of that grace that you have so generously given us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Now, as we have moved through the Sermon on the Mount, we have seen the impossibly high standard that Jesus has set for kingdom citizens, haven't we? I mean, you move through this and it is clear that it is impossible for us to truly live up to the standards of the Sermon on the Mount by our own ability. You can't do it. You, not on your own. It's impossible with our sinful natures. Just look at some of the things that Jesus has revealed in his teachings. We get unrighteously angry with others, don't we? And then we don't forgive them. We lust after others. We seek earthly treasure. We don't keep our word. And then we look for loopholes to uh, explain away our unreliability. We worry we're judgmental, 
And brothers and sisters, I'm just hitting the highlights. There is so much more here. And then back in chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus made it very clear what the standard is. He said, you, therefore, must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That bad news points us to the good news. Our need for his grace is met by his provision of grace. Praise God. So when we see Jesus in verse 7 ask, say, we're to ask, we're to seek, we're to knock. What is it that we're supposed to be asking? What are we to ask for? Now, we've seen some have tried to teach that this means we're supposed to be like that impetuous child in the toy store who has zero impulse control and is constantly haranguing their parents going, gimme, gimme, gimme. You've probably been to the store and heard some kids like that over in the toy department or in the grocery aisle and the candies and all that good stuff. You know, there's false teachers out there who have personified this attitude. Some of them, and, and listen, I don't have a problem naming names because the scripture names the names of false teachers. We have to let folks know who they are so that they can be avoided. People like Kenneth Copeland, people like Creflo Dollar. These people are out there and listen, they have accumulated for themselves so much personal wealth and material possessions that I am fully convinced that if Jesus came to them today and said the same thing that he said to that rich young ruler, they would be like the rich young ruler and be disheartened and go away sorrowful because they have many possessions. Listen, that's what happens. Our possessions get a hold of us and they don't let go. The prosperity gospel answers this question, what are we to be asking with a focus on selfish material gain? But in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, we see a very, very different answer. First of all, Jesus is teaching throughout the Sermon on the Mount and points us to the need of God's grace for how we have fallen short of his law. So the first thing that we ought to be asking God for is the forgiveness of our sin. We need to go to him and say, Father, forgive us. That is it. Because we cannot keep God's law. Every time we try to keep God's law of our own ability, we fail. And you know what? We spectacularly fail. In the language of today, it's an epic fail. That is what we do when we try to keep God's law on our own. We fall flat. We miss the mark. But praise God, Jesus came to deliver those who cannot keep the law. And that's all of us. That is all of us. He came to bear the punishment that we who have broken the law deserve to pay. And we've seen that these actions, ask, seek, and knock. But, but let's look at what the outcome is. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Hallelujah. When we go to God and ask for his forgiveness in Christ for our sins. It will happen. You will be forgiven. He will give what you ask for. There's no more important, no more fundamental question that we need to answer than this one. What should we ask God for? Forgiveness of our sins. Because in our first asking, we receive justification. And in our continued and persistent asking, we receive sanctification. We grow in our faith. And in fact, that sanctification reminds us of another thing we should ask. Help in our obedience. We need to ask the Lord to help us follow his commands. When we see this ask, seek, knock command that Jesus gives, this imperative, it's a reminder that we need the Holy Spirit 
in our lives. Each and every day, we need the Spirit's power to live out what Jesus has taught. That's it. But whenever we try to obey the law by our own power as opposed to the Spirit's power, we inevitably land squarely in the camp of legalism. We end up like modern-day Pharisees, and here's why. We understand the spirit of God's law is greater than we could possibly keep. So we focus on the letter of the law. And even then, we can't keep it. So what do we do? We create other laws around it. And those are the ones that we live up to. And once we live up to those, we look down on everybody else who can't live up to our own standards, don't we? We become rather judgmental. That is not the life that we have been called to live. Jesus said, take my yoke, for it is light. How can he say that? How, we see the commands. How can we say that? We can see, well, you can say that. Because he's telling you, you, can, you can't do this on your own, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, you can do this through me. You see, it's light because he has personally fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. He kept every bit of it for you and for me. He fulfilled it. And he offers us his obedience and righteousness as an inheritance. When we put our faith in him and we're adopted as sons and daughters of the king, his righteousness and his obedience are imputed to us. We benefit from what he has done. Praise God. That's how we can stand justified before God on the judgment day. Not by anything we have done, but by everything Jesus Christ has done. That is our justification. He is our salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not to desire to grow in our holiness, to grow in our godliness, to become more and more like him. But it does mean that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can grow day by day in our sanctification and in our personal holiness. You see, asking, this kind of asking that Jesus describes, it leads us to the gospel, not to material possessions. When Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, it leads you to the gospel. It does not lead you to accumulating stuff. That's the anti-gospel. The prosperity gospel would tell us to focus on the here and now, but Jesus says we are to think eternally. The prosperity gospel says, ask God for your daily filet mignon. Jesus says, ask for your daily bread. It's not about getting the, the best of everything now. It's about getting daily grace and daily strength to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we have called, been called to do. You see, Jesus is more concerned with our personal holiness than he is with our portfolios. That's just, the re, that's just the reality. He's more concerned with our hearts, how loving and God-focused they are, than how big and well-furnished your house is. He wants you to be a disciple focused on discipleship living as citizens of the kingdom of God in this world. But let me tell you something. That's no easy task. I bet every one of us here this morning can talk about how difficult it is to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world. It's not easy. There are many temptations, many trials that we face. But praise God, that's why we have the helper. That's why we have the Holy Spirit, so that we can live as disciples here. So when Jesus tells us this, he's saying, when you ask for forgiveness, your Father in heaven will give it. Seek after his grace, which gives you the strength to follow in his obedience. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks 
it will be opened. Now, all of this is not to say we're not to ask God for our material needs as well. That's not it either. But, but if, we, if we took that position, and some people have responded to things like the prosperity gospel by swinging too far to the other side and saying we should only ask for spiritual things, never ask for material provision. Well, that's ignoring the model prayer, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. Listen, God knows that we have needs. We have physical needs. You need food. You need water. You need clothing. You need shelter. Well, we can talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs all day long, but the point is we need some certain things that, that must be provided for us to survive in this world. God is aware of those things. The problem comes when we elevate those to be our primary focus, especially in prayer, rather than the spiritual needs that we have, justification, sanctification, growth, spiritual growth, holiness, purity. Jesus' teaching about asking, seeking, and knocking assumes those needs, but even more than that, it emphasizes God's gracious provision. So Jesus illustrates this point by drawing a comparison between earthly fathers and our heavenly father. Look with me in verses 9 through 11. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now let me say at the outset that yes, there are terrible, evil parents who would do these kind of things. That's not who Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about ordinary parents. And ordinary parents would not do these things. Now, but I do want you to understand that this illustration that Jesus gives would have been jarring to his listeners. Imagine his disciples seated there in the Galilean countryside on the mountain. They're seated, they're listening to Jesus, and he says, Who among you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? And if you looked across the Galilean landscape, you would have seen tons of these flat, roundish, oblong, brown stones that looked like loaves of bread would have been very similar to what they were used to eating. Or what about a snake? I mean, the, the, the landscape is filled with venomous snakes. Who, if their son said, Dad, will you give me a fish? I'm hungry. Gets a hold of a venomous serpent and gives it to the kid and says, Here, try this. No one. No one. He said that you guys wouldn't do that and you're evil. And I know some people would take offense at that and say, well, why did Jesus say that they're evil? They're doing good things for their kids. Well, we're evil because we're sinners. You have to understand that. Our sin nature has corrupted every aspect of our being. And that's what's meant by the theological term total depravity. Some people have gotten that mistaken. They think total depravity means people are as bad as they possibly could be all the time. That would be called absolute depravity. And that's simply, by God's common grace, thankfully, not the case. But what total depravity teaches us is that every part of our being, our minds, our reason, our emotions, our intentions, our motivations, our intellect, every part of who we are has been corrupted by our sin nature. And apart from God, there's nothing we can do that's good. Even our good deeds, as Isaiah would say, are like filthy rags because we're not doing them with the right intentions. We're not doing them with the right motivations. And therefore, they're sinful. So this is an accurate description of who we are. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. 
So even a sin-corrupted earthly father gives good gifts to his children. So how much more, Jesus asks, will your perfect, loving, merciful, gracious, heavenly father give good things to you, his children? Wow. You know, the very act of asking Seeking and knocking demonstrates our reliance on the Heavenly Father for all things. First of all, for salvation. There is no salvation on earth except through Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's exclusive. There is, listen, you can try everything else. Everybody likes to talk about, well, there's so many other religions. No, there aren't. There's just one other religion, man-centered religion or Christ. Those are your two options. Take your pick. The only one that will save is Christ. That's all. And, and that's what he says. He says, this is it. But a lot of people have come to the Bible and they said, wow, Jesus' teachings are so amazing. And they'll say, I'm a red letter Christian. As if the black letters don't matter. They all matter. Every one of them. Listen, Jesus' teachings won't get you into heaven. Jesus will. That's it. Only Jesus and his work that he accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection, that's it. And how can we receive this salvation? Asking, Father, save me. Father, forgive me. We ask and he hears and he gives. But second, we have God's provision of our daily needs as well. The food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes that we wear, the house over our heads, all of these are provided by God's own gracious hand. Now Jesus emphasizes here that God will answer our prayers for our needs with good things, not all things. Let's be clear about that. He'll give us good things, the things we need, He's not going to give us everything, and he's not going to give us everything that we ask for. You see, we're not Aladdin, and God's not a big blue genie that is bound by us to do whatever it is we ask. That's not the way that this works. You know, I think that every one of us here this morning can probably look back in our life and think of something that we fervently prayed for and asked for from God, and in hindsight can say, thank you, Lord, for saying no. When I was in high school, I played varsity football. And as I started out playing, I wanted to try out, at least, for quarterback. I was pretty good at that. I could throw the ball a mile, I could hit people actually with the ball, which was, you know, kind of a big thing for a quarterback. I thought I was smart enough to play the position. And I was certainly not built for something like, say, the offensive line. I mean, I was almost as tall as I am now. I was about 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11, and I was about 50 pounds less than I am now. I was a scrawny, lanky kid, okay? Um, Erin has seen my high school yearbook photo. She, she can attest to that. So, coach put me on the line. Why? I, I don't know. I never would even be given the chance to try out for the quarterback position. But let me tell you, I prayed. Oh, I prayed. I had faith. Lord, please just give me a chance for this. And years came and went, and I remained a defensive lineman. That was it. 
Now, with the benefit of 20-something years of hindsight, not long ago I was talking to my uncle, and my uncle uh, was a star football player when he was a young man, too, in high school, and uh, he really was pushing me, and he brought this up. He said, you know, he said, back then you really should have been a quarterback. You really didn't have any business on the line. And I laughed and said, oh, I know, I know. I said, but, you know, I said, I've been thinking about that, Uncle Ron. And I said, honestly, that's a, that's a blessing that God didn't allow me to do that. Because God knew my young heart. And he knew that if I became the quarterback of the high school football team, my pride would be unbearable. I'd be the biggest jerk that you could imagine. God was protecting me from myself. Yeah, that was my desire. I wanted it bad, but I'm so thankful that he said no. Now, please don't confuse this with the horribly inaccurate description of unanswered prayers. I grew up in the mid-1990s in Georgia in high school. That was, I graduated in 1995. So I could not escape Garth Brooks. And I could not escape his song, Unanswered Prayers. And I cringed every time I heard that song because I'm like, oh, this is so theologically wrong. I'm not looking to Garth Brooks for my theology, by the way, just to let you know. I understand what he's saying. And I understand what people who use that terminology mean. But... But it's not that God doesn't answer prayers. God does answer prayers. It's just that sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. Sometimes the answer is not him or not her. And sometimes it's not there. And God's provision is wonderful. When God answers no, not yet, not this person or something along those lines, we're demonstrating our reliance on him for all th things, which includes the wisdom to know what is good, what is better, and what is best for us. Now, this imagery of asking, seeking, and knocking, it reminds us that we should be persistent in our prayers. The Holman Christian Standard Bible translates verse 7 this way. It says, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. See, this is an accurate translation of the Greek. The imperative in the Greek is a present imperative. That's the, the, uh, the grammar. And that means that it's a consistent, continuous action. Sometimes there's what's called the aorist. And the aorist is a one-time command. Do this. But the present imperative is a keep on doing this. Don't stop. And that's what Jesus is using here. He's using that form of speech. And he's calling us to be persistent in the request that we bring before the throne of grace. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, Jesus tells the parable of the unrighteous judge. Of the unjust judge. And in that, we find a widow who is seeking after justice, and she goes to the judge, and the judge doesn't give it to her. But guess what? The widow doesn't stop. And the judge finally says, oh, she's going to wear me down. Going to break me, so just give her what she wants. Now, just like here, where Jesus is not saying God's going to just give you whatever you want, he's saying that we're to be persistent in seeking after God's provision and God's grace. We should never give up asking for that. And we cannot, look, we're not going to wear down God. It's not as if God's going to be like, oh my goodness, here's that kid again. And they just won't stop. Fine, I'll give them whatever they want. That's not it. He tells us that God will give us what we need in his timing. His perfect timing. But too often we treat prayer as if we're going to change God's mind by our petitions. Oh Lord, I'm going I'm to get you to see that you really should give me this thing that I'm asking for. And if I just ask enough, then you'll give it to me. That's not it. You see, we need to learn that our persistence in prayer is about changing our hearts to be in line with God's will, not God's will to change and be in line with our hearts. That's prayer. 
And this is nowhere better seen than in the evaluation of what we're to be praying to receive in the first place. You know, so often our prayers are selfish. I don't think anyone here prays for their sports team to win. Maybe you do. If you're a Lions fan, you know that doesn't work. <laughs> but the reality is that that's typical of what we ask for. What dominates our prayer requests? When we go to the Lord in prayer, do we ask him for that promotion at work? Or do you persistently ask him for a pure heart and the grace to stay away from the things that lead to impure thoughts and actions? Do you ask for help getting out of a financial bind? Or do you keep knocking on the door of heaven asking God to give you sanctified wisdom in financial matters? What is it that we ask for? You see, brothers and sisters, more than anything else in our prayer lives, we should be seeking, asking, and knocking for the things that make us more like Jesus. That's what we should be seeking after, heavenly treasure. What greater treasure could there be than to be like Jesus? That is the greatest thing that we could possibly have, is to be like our Savior, there is nothing. Listen, all the things of this world will leave you empty. It'll leave you empty. Think about some of those immensely wealthy people, the robber barons of the 1800s and early 1900s, people like J.P. Morgan, people like John D. Rockefeller, people like uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, these men amassed fortunes that we can't even comprehend, honestly. It's so, so huge, we can't, we can't do it. And do you know how much they took with them when they died? Zero. Not one penny. You can accumulate all you want here, but seek after the heavenly treasure that we have in Christ Jesus. You know, in the opening chapter of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul said he was in persistent prayer for them. And this is what he said. He, he said that he prayed that they would have their, the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Wow. That is thick stuff. He prayed this for the believers in Ephesus because he said at the outset of his letter that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see, these great rewards, these spiritual blessings, they're ours, but God gives them to us when we're ready for them. And when we pray persistently, we're being prepared to receive them. Now, we're not only to pray with persistence, we're also to pray with confidence. Hebrews 4.16 says that we are to draw with confidence to the throne of grace. With confidence. And isn't that what we see in Jesus' own words here? He's shown us the assurance that what we ask for, we will receive. There's a confidence there. You, it will be given to you. It, you will find. It will be open to you. And then he says, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Ask in confidence. And we can be certain and confident that our Father knows our needs. He knows what you and I need and our asking, our seeking, our knocking, it's demonstrating our dependence on him in all things as well as our preparation to receive those good things. But too often the requests that we make of the Father in heaven are less about our needs and they're more about our wants, aren't they? They're more about the things that we want regardless 
of what these may specifically look like in all of our lives, they all center around the same thing, and that's our happiness. We're more concerned with our happiness, but there's a slight problem with that. I encourage you, search the scriptures, study them, look through them. Nowhere will you find anyone praying for happiness. You will not find a prayer for happiness in the Bible. You will not find a command to pray for happiness. And you will not find a promise that you'll live a happy life as a believer. You might find something else. Be prepared for that. I know this flies in the face of everything that we hear, especially from those who, who preach a prosperity gospel, and it certainly isn't going to get a major book publishing deal in the Christian world. But God really is not concerned with your happiness. He is concerned with your holiness. He is concerned with conforming you to the image of of his son, Jesus Christ. That's holiness. And that's what God wants for you. Happiness is fleeting. It's fleeting. God knows that holiness is our most pressing need. It is what we need the most. And he is prepared to give it to us as we grow spiritually. Now, he also knows our physical needs as well, and he'll supply them for us as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Just as an earthly father would never supply his children with items that do not meet their needs, neither will our heavenly father overlook or forget the things that we need. And again, I must emphasize, he's not promised to give us all those things we want. We're not going to get the finest morsels of food. We're not going to get the trendiest clothing. We're not going to get the swankiest house. He hasn't promised those things to all believers. He hasn't promised those things to any believers. But he has promised that he will provide for his children. And so often, many of us can say, oh, but... Yeah, the Lord's, the Lord's met my needs, but let me tell you so much more. Let me tell you how my cup overflows. Let me tell you about how he gave me so, so much in Jesus Christ. So I tell you, brothers and sisters, this morning, keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking with confidence because the Father will provide what we need. But let us be sure to remember to pursue first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, if, if you're here this morning and you don't yet have eternal life through Jesus Christ, I have to tell you, it's available for the asking. It's free. It is a free gift from Jesus. And it's available to you here this morning if you will ask God for it. Seek his forgiveness and repent of your sins. It's nothing you do. It's his gift. But if you're already a believer this morning, I want to ask you this question as we close. Can you imagine what would happen in Christ's church if we kept asking, kept seeking, and kept knocking for his kingdom and righteousness in our own lives and in the lives of our brothers and sisters. What would happen in Jesus' church if that's what marked the requests of his people? Not what we can get, but what he will give us spiritually. That would be a church on fire. That would be a church that would be about the kingdom. And that would be a group of people who would be growing in holiness in amazing ways. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are so thankful for your generosity. We thank you for how you did not even hold back your son to pay the price that we could not pray, pay 
so that we might have a reconciled relationship with you through him. Father, through, the, through his death on the cross and through his glorious resurrection, we have eternal life. Thank you, Father. You have given that so generously, and it is ours for the asking. But, Father, you don't stop there. You keep giving to those who ask, who seek, who knock, who pray with persistence, who pray with confidence. Not so that we can get a bunch of stuff and material wealth, but, Father, that we can know the power of Christ's resurrection. So that we can be more like him. Father, this is our plea this morning. This is what we're asking for. Make us more like Jesus. And let us go out telling others about all these good gifts you have given us in him. We ask this in his name. Amen.